Dr. Torres is a professor of medicine at UT Southwestern Medical Center and director of the lung transplant and pulmonary hypertension programs at the William P. Clements Jr. University Hospital in Dallas. Dr. Torres developed the pulmonary hypertension program, which is now the largest such program in the United States. His clinical interests are very broad, including pulmonary hypertension, lung transplantation, lung volume reduction surgery for emphysema. Um, let's see, I've got to move my injections in immunosuppressed patients and clinical outcomes research in lung transplantation and pulmonary hypertension. Very broad uh, perspective. Dr. Torres has also served as a principal investigator or co-investigator in many clinical trials, including multi-center clinical trials to improve the survival of lung transplant patients. In addition, he's working on testing new equipment to improve the donor organ supply. Texas Monthly named him a super doctor in, oops, better go back, just in 2018, and he was included in D Magazine's Best Doctor list for 2018. In the same year, Dr. Torres received UT Southwestern's Program Development Award. So Dr. Torres, we welcome you, and we're so glad you're here. Well, thank you guys. Thank you, Diane, for introducing me, and thank you to the Sterma Foundation for inviting me to talk about the treatment for lung disease as well as lung transplantation for patients with scleroderma. As uh, you guys know, I have been, I work at UT Southwestern. This is the main campus of UT Southwestern where we have Clements uh, down here and the cancer center and the outpatient buildings offices. Today, I want to talk about the treatment of uh, scleroderma lung disease and then lung transplantation. So when we talk about the treatment of uh, interstitial lung disease from scleroderma, we have two main therapies available. The anti-inflammatory medications, which lower your immune system, and that's how they help treat the disease. And then the second types of medications are what we call the anti-fibrotic medications that try to relieve the scarring that is formed from the inflammation that was caused um, by the by scleroderma. And then we'll talk about the lung transplant per se. So first of all, um, let's talk about the anti-inflammatory pathway. Initially, historically, we were using cyclosporine, uh, cyclophosphamide, cytoxin, for the treatment of interstitial lung disease from scleroderma. That was the main driving therapy for many, many decades. But then in 2016, there was a large study using mycophenolates, uh, what we call CELSEP or myfortic nowadays. And this was a large clinical trial uh, where about 140 patients were split 70-70 to take mycophenolate or cytoxin, cyclophosphamide, and um, then follow them for about two years and see how they were doing. And the results were that both of the medications, patients placed on cytox, cyclophosphamide or mycophenolate, both of them improve their lung function, that FBC that Dr. Assisi was talking that we use to monitor our patients uh, to see if they're responding to therapy. So both patients groups improve. So that was great. Mycophenolate work as well as cyclophosphamide for treatment of interstitial lung disease. But what was even nicer was that the adverse events, the side effects of the medications were very different. Those patients taking mycophenolate, they had less, less leukopenia, neutropenia, uh, anemia, thrombocytopenia, blood in the urine uh, was similar, um, and infections rates were very similar. So given that the medication of using mycophenolate was associated with less side effects, 
is a great armamentarium that we, we have nowadays for treatment of the interstitial lung disease associated by scleroderma. Over the past uh, year, uh, as a matter, matter of fact, this uh, publication was just published uh, in January, Antifibrotic medications like nintedanib has been studied on patients who have scleroderma interstitial lung disease. And this was a great uh, study from the census trial. Uh, they had a subgroup that was analyzed of patients who were on mycophenolate and were given nintedanib. So the study is kind of interesting. You have four groups. Uh, you have initially 580 patients randomized to taking nintedanib versus placebo. But of those, half of them were taking mycophenolate or not taking mycophenolate. And on the placebo, half of them were taking mycophenolate and the other half were not taking mycophenolate. So basically you have four groups at the end where, that we were studying. And then we look at them over the next 52 weeks and see what the outcomes were. What was nice about the results of this, uh, this study was that patients taking mycophenolate, um, if you gave them nintedanib, they did not drop their lung functions as much as those patients who were not given nintedanib. But at the same time, um, the patients who were not taking mycophenolate also responded to nintedanib compared to those who were not taking anything. So given these results, the best outcomes are those patients who are on nintedanib and taking mycophenolate, where they have the least amount of drop of the, the, their lung functions over the following 52 weeks. So in addition to these uh, therapies, now we have what we call the biologicals. These are antibodies uh, directed towards certain anti-inflammatory and anti-fibrotic uh, uh, pathways that can cause lung fibrosis. The one that has been studied on patients with scleroderma lung disease is tocilizumab. And this antibody, uh, was studied on patients who had interstitial lung disease uh, getting placebo versus tocilizumab. And obviously their lung functions were similar in both groups, et cetera, and high resolution CT scans. But what we noticed on this uh, study was that those patients who were given tocilizumab had a less drop on their lung functions compared to those patients who were uh, on the placebo arm. That's at 48 weeks of the study. So over time now, you are going to see that tocilizumab is going to be utilized in the armamentarium to treat interstitial lung disease from scleroderma. And this is a table way of presenting the same data where patients on tocilizumab had a decreased drop on their lung functions compared to um, the placebo arm. So that's the latest on the medical therapy of patients with scleroderma lung disease. Now, when everything else fails, then that's where we start talking about lung transplantation. And lung transplantation has been around now for over 50 years. Um, the first lung transplant was done by Dr. Hardy in 63. And then as medications became available to keep the organs going and prevent them from rejection, then um, in 1980, cyclosporin becomes available. And then the more success stories start happening to the point where by 1990, we are doing all heart lung, single lungs and double lung transplants for the treatment of advanced lung disease. And there are two major key points in the history of lung transplantation. 
The first one is in 2005, where we do a long allocation score where patients are given a priority to get lung transplantation depending on how sick they are. The, high, the more, the sicker you are, the higher you are in the waiting list. And then about three years ago, in 2018, there's a new change in how to allocate organs where instead of um, allocating organs immediately around the center where the organ is being harvested, now you have 250 miles radius from that donor where that list that those patients are going to be allocated uh, to get priority for that particular organ. When we look at patients who have interstitial lung disease, like Dr. Assisi was pointing out, um, we are going to see patients who have small lung volumes, have thickening interstitium, and these patients have significant interstitial lung disease. When you do a CT scan on the chest, you start seeing the round glass opacities, the lung fibrosis, predominantly at the basis of the lungs, some honeycombing um, present in the lungs, etc. And this is a patient who has significant interstitial lung disease um, from uh, lung fibrosis. Obviously, when we have patients who have lung fibrosis, our main concern is that usually they tend to be on the older side and they can develop malignancies and other comorbidities like diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity, and osteoporosis. I, I left a slide for, of a patient who has pulmonary arterial hypertension because patients with scleroderma can develop Interse uh, not just interstitial lung disease, but they can also have pulmonary hypertension and we can do a heart lung transplant or double lung transplant depending on the patient for the treatment of their severe pulmonary <laughs> hypertension. And again, these are large pulmonary arteries on a patient who require a heart lung transplant. Um, there are a few caveats on patients who have scleroderma and require uh, lung transplantation. Number one, uh, if they develop pulmonary hypertension, they will need a double lung transplant. The reason for that is because of our experience back in the 1990s, where we were doing single lung transplantations for patients with pulmonary hypertension, and we had uh, significant mortality uh, in the first month after lung transplantation where we felt that it was too dangerous to do a single lung transplant and patients would benefit better from having a double lung transplantation. Also, it's important to remember that patients with uh, scleroderma can have inter in, uh, gastrointestinal involvement and that can be a problem because patients can have the esophagus involved with their scleroderma to the point of having severe dysmotility, achalasia, where the esophagus doesn't move whatsoever. Also, they can have bowel dysmotility, malabsorption, and you can imagine how this can become a problem after a lung transplant, where the lung transplant per se can be perfect, can be outstanding, go, uh, without any complications, but then because of all these other problems with the intestines, then the patient not do well. Obviously, skin is involved in patients with scleroderma, and one of the concerns is this, the ray nodes. When uh, a patient with scleroder uh, scleroderma has ray nodes and goes into a cold weather, their hands are going to change into purple. And it's a ischemic uh, lesion uh, in the arteries of the, um, that is being affected. So imagine you are going to the operating room and if the operating room, they keep the temperature very low, 
Suddenly, you can develop ischemic limbs and lose a finger, a hand, or a, a toe, or a foot just because of the surgery. And so a lot of things are done to try to prevent that type of complications during a lung transplantation. Obviously, there just because you have scleroderma doesn't mean that you don't have any other medical problems. For example, you can have osteoporosis, you can have muscle disease, uh, you may have had thoracic surgeries, needing high dosages of steroids, being overweight, underweight, have substance abuse, being on mechanical ventilation, all of those being relative contraindications and not a single one probably will stop a lung transplant, but a combination of them can easily pro, uh, prevent us from continuing. Over time, the age limit for lung transplantation has been pushed up. Um, if, you, if I had given this talk 10 years ago, I would have told you that our uh, age limit for lung transplantation was 65, 70 years uh, uh, of age. Now, up to 75, we have if the patient has no other medical problems other than their lung disease, we, we can proceed to do a lung transplantation. There are certain infections that are too difficult for us to handle. Fungi, a typical mycobacteria, and unless we have a good handle of that infection prior to the lung transplant, it's just it's extremely difficult to proceed, do a lung transplant, try to prevent that infection from spreading into the new lung. And we have to consider that when making the recommendation to proceed with a lung transplantation. Diabetes, just because of it, it, its complications affecting the kidneys, affecting eyesight, et cetera. And then bacteria that can have resistance to many of our antibiotics we have to monitor those types of bacteria and know if we are able to have antibiotics that are going to be able to be used for the treatment of the, uh, for its treatment after a lung transplant. Um, there are certain things that completely prevent us uh, from doing a lung transplantation, for example, if your disease has affected your bone marrow where your cell lines are not being produced, suddenly you would be requiring blood transfusions all the time and your immune system then would uh, start getting active and then destroy the new lungs. Patients who have liver disease, kidney disease, um, we cannot proceed with a, a, a single organ transplant just because our medications would completely harm that organ and then suddenly uh, the patient would die. Certain malignancies like solid organ malignancies like breast cancer, renal cancer, colon cancer, melanomas, we have to wait at least five years after lung cancers. We have to wait at least five years after they, the patient has been deemed cured before proceeding with a transplant, just because if you do a, a, a lung transplant, the medications that we use to lower the immune system would allow those cancers to spread. Uh, so we have to make sure that there is no residual cancer cells left behind. Certain infections like uh, HIV also are a contraindication. As we talked uh, about it before, the lung allocation score, it's uh, a score that we give to all the patients in the waiting list. And it's a, in that score is the combination of the probability of survival in the waiting list at one year and survival after lung transplantation in one year. What that means is that if you're very sick, you, your score uh, is very high because your survival without a transplant is very small. But at the same time, if you're too sick, then the, sort of the chances of making it through surgery is lower and that can lower your score at the end. And then um, the distribution of organs where now we look at 
that long allocation score around the 250 nautical miles radius from the donor hospital to uh, allocate the organ to those patients first. This is what normal lungs look after lung transplantation. And this is um, just a few days after lung transplant. You can see how pretty the new lungs look. And you still have chest tubes, one, two, uh, three, and a fourth one hiding back here. And these have fresh lung transplant and how lungs should look after doing a double lung transplantation. Can things go wrong after a lung transplant? Absolutely. And the first thing that can happen is what we call a reimplantation response. Remember, you are taking an organ from a donor, putting it on ice and bringing it to another uh, facility and then hooking it up to a new patient. That organ has been preserved um, with uh, solutions to keep the organ from getting damaged. But when you implant and open the normal blood uh, to that organ, suddenly there is any small, any damage to the small ve blood vessels of that transplanted lung will cause um, the water part of the blood to sneak out of the blood vessel and get into the lungs and the lungs are get full of water. And this tends to happen in the next, in the first 96 hours after lung transplantation. We have many different techniques to try to mitigate or improve or resolve that reperfusion injury and make the patient do well. This is an image of a patient who has severe reperfusion injury. And you can see how white that right lung is, and that's reperfusion injury, a lot of water in that lung that we need to fix so that the patient can oxygenate. But not only can um, certain things, mechanical things can happen uh, to our patients, but certain infections are more prevalent on our patients, and one of them is CMB, cytomegalovirus infection, and it's, this is a virus that can cause significant leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, hepatitis, pneumonia, and the patients can die from this disease, uh, that, this viral infection. And you can see how in this patient just had a, a fluid around the right lung. And after we took the fluid out, we saw haziness in the lung and we felt that that was not normal. So we did biopsies of that lung and suddenly you can see all these pink material around the nuclei and when you stain it for CMB you can see the very dark stain uh, associated with the infection of CMB. And we have many ways of treating CMB and medications to prevent that infection from destroying the lungs. Not only our patients can develop certain viral infections but they also can have other types of infections in here, you can see that little bump next to the, to the heart. And when you do a CAT scan of the chest, you can see a pulmonary nodule hidden next to the heart. And obviously that was a nodule that was very difficult to, uh, to get to by doing a bronchoscopy. So we had to do surgery to take it out. And when we took it out, it was an aspergillus infection. It's a fungi that can destroy and kill the patient. And removing that fungi and then putting the patient on medications to treat the fungi is the right therapy. And the patient did very well, and she's alive 10, 15 years after lung transplantation. Not only patients can have reperfusion injury infections, but also the immune system um can attack that new organ remember your immune system has been developed over millions of years to destroy things that don't belong into a human body that new lung doesn't belong there and the immune system's job is to destroy it and though we use a lot of, a lot of different medications to 
prevent uh, the activation of that immune system to recognize the new lungs, we at times can fail. So when we have uh, draft this function, there's what we call the hyperacute re reaction. This one tends to be extremely rare. That's when um, by a mistake gets done and you put the wrong organ um, because the blood type got missed. And if you remember about five, seven years ago, something like that made the news nationally when a patient at Duke got the wrong blood type organ and that created a lot of uh, chaos throughout the country and many things were put in place so that that type of problem would not be repeated again. Um, but that was a hyperacute rejection where you put an organ, your immune system is already predisposed to destroy that type of organ and you have severe rejection. Most of the time though, we will have primary draft failure from infections, preservation not going well or uh, mechanical uh, problems during the transplant. Acute rejection can present in different ways like fever, low oxygen, fa fatigue, tiredness, cough, and usually we are going to make this diagnosis by looking at the lung functions, chest x-ray, doing bronchoscopy, biopsies, and seeing what uh, what evidence uh, we have towards that this disorder. This is a patient who had hissiness, that whiteness in the transplanted lungs, and we felt that this was caused by acute rejection. We give them high dosages of steroids, and within three days, five days, the lungs completely clear, and the patient is able to breathe normally and have and no sequelae from it. When we do the biopsies, what we tend to see, this is a little blood vessel. You can see all these black dots. Those are neutrophils attacking the blood vessel and the lung tissue. And that's what we call acute rejection. And depending on how many layers of these blue cells are then we traded between A1, A2, and A3, and then A4 being severe. Um, in addition to having episodes of rejection, um, there are certain medications that we use in our patients to prevent rejection that over time can cause problems and complications, one of them being what we call post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder. We tend to see this type of disorder when we have immunosuppress our patients significantly with certain medications like antibodies against lymphocytes to lower the immune system of the patient. These patients can develop Epstein-Barr viral infections and Usually when we see this disorder, it's about eight months after giving these types of medications and it usually presents with small pulmonary nodules. In this patient, you can see uh, this is a patient who had emphysema, a transplanted left lung, and you can see a little spot hidden back there. When you do the CAT scan of the chest, you can see the large mass in, uh, in that right lung. And when you take that lesion out, suddenly you see all these blue cells that are um, very similar uh, to each other. And when you do certain markers, they are all identical. And this is what we call post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder. These types of disorders, you give them certain types of medications um, that we use for treatment of lymphoma, and they, then they can go away very easily. Not only can we face infections, rejections, uh, malignancies, but also when we do uh, the procedure, things can go wrong. 
this is um, the bronchi where you have the nor the native lung airway here, and then this is the transplanted lung going down. So we use blue sutures to see that uh, margin between what was native of the person and what the transplant where the transplant starts. And this is a normal airway looking in a patient. This particular patient, you can see that there is the blue lines and then there's a hole. Well, this is what we call the hesens breakdown of the suture line and suddenly there's no tissue there, that space outside of the airway. This patient had to go back to the operating room and had the whole anastomosis redo, redone to fix that lesion. So over the last 20, 30 years, the total number of transplants being performed in the, in the world has continued to increase. Currently, we're doing between 4,000 4, to 4,500 transplants a year throughout the world. Most of the lung transplants nowadays are double lung transplants compared to single lung transplants. And that has been a change that has been happening uh, consistently over the years. That doesn't mean one is worse than the other one. They're just different. But it's something that has been a trend. Over the decades, we have become, be, become better at taking care of patients after a lung transplantation. I remember. When I started doing lung transplantation, our uh, five-year survival was 50%. Now we are uh, about 60%. Uh, I'm sorry, about six uh, years, 50% survival. So over time, the with improvement of, thera of immunosuppressive therapy, so better understanding of disease, more technology available for us, we are doing better. So today, 50% of our patients are alive at six and a half years. 50% of our patients are alive at six and a half years. Lung transplantation is not a cure. We are exchanging illnesses. But on a patient with life expectancies one to two years, six years is a big difference. When we look at the types of organs that, uh, uh, type of diseases that uh, we are doing lung transplantation, we have COPD, lung fibrosis, etc. but scleroderma falls here in the connective tissue disorder. So, we do not tend to do that many transplants for scleroderma. It is true. We could uh, hide some of the scleroderma patients here in interstitial lung disease, not the idiopathic pulmonary uh, fibrosis patients. So somewhere between one and 5% mm -hmm. of the transplants are for connective tissue disorders, scleroderma type of uh, organs. The, life expectancy after lung transplantation with this scleroderma uh, lung diseases is about six and a half years. There are other diseases like cystic fibrosis whose life expectancy is better close to 10 years, but others like idiopathic uh, pulmonary fibrosis where it's shorter, about five years. Um, they are... Uh, Certain diseases um, that make the, um, the da uh, it's dangerous uh, to do a lung transplantation and, um, for example, donor uh, organ having uh, hypertension, uh, HLA mismatches, hospitalization at the time of transplant, CMB mismatching, um, other diagnosis, other than COPD for lung transplantation, et cetera. All of those um, uh, 
factors are going to affect the five years survival. Age of the recipient, the older you are, you have a higher risk of not doing as well at five years compared to younger patients. Um, that's why the older you are, the more perfect you have to be. You cannot have coronary artery disease. You cannot have other um, risk factors because it will affect your survival after lung transplantation. The number of transplants that a center does uh, in the past three years also affects. So you need centers that are doing about 30 transplants a year. If they're doing less than that, suddenly your mortality at five years uh, is higher than centers who are doing transplants more frequently. So when we talk about lung transplantation, there are certain things that we are doing to improve uh, the survival of patients while they are in the waiting list, as well as increasing the norm number of organs available for lung transplantation. The first one, uh, keeping patients alive before a transplant. This is a, a patient who um, was very sick and we had ECMO, extracorporeal uh, membrane oxygenation, where you take, the patient is so sick that we cannot provide enough oxygen through the lungs for the patient because of their lungs being so damaged, et cetera. So what you can do is you take blood from the patient, send it to a machine. The machine then puts oxygen in the blood and sends the blood back to the patient. This is the technology or how our room would have looked 10 years ago if we were, um, if we had a patient needing ECMO. All that technology now has been simplified with this, this technology. The cannulas also have evolved so that they are better, simpler to place. And, um, and you, this change allows to have survivals that in the past, prior to 10 years ago, I had a close to 0% survival seven days after placing a patient on ECMO to now having patients alive two or three months with this technology, keeping them alive until we're able to do a lung transplantation. In addition to doing that, we also have uh, technology that allows us to use organs that otherwise we would not have. And there are two different systems out there to preserve organs and to move organs from place to place. There's the transmedic as well as the ex vivo uh, technology. This is the transmedic technology where you take an organ um, that you harvest, you connect it to the machine and you oxygenate and keep the organ perfused and preserved with blood-like substance um, you not freeze or cool down the organ, you keep them at room temperature, et cetera, and you keep the organ alive until you do the transplant. The ex vivo technology where you take the organ and you cool it down, um, get it to the machine, you test the, the organ to make sure that the organ is going to be useful that the organ did, did not have a significant damage and that the, it's going to work well uh, when we do the transplant. This technology about, uh, allows us to test the organ for about four, six hours before we say, yeah, it's a good organ, let's utilize it. We can do bronchoscopies, we can do x-rays, we can test oxygenation, etc., and say, yes, this organ is working well, or no, this organ is not a viable organ. We better not use it because if we use it, the outcome is going to be poor. So in Texas at UT Southwestern, we do about 60 to 70 transplants a year. 
um, this year with the COVID and our volumes on the drop. Um, that puts us top 20 in the nation. We were yeah, historically top 10 to top 15 in the nation in volumes uh, in Texas. We're the second largest program in the, in, in the state. Some of the things that we need to look at when you are going to have a transplant survival. Are you going to be able to stay alive while you're waiting for a transplant? Um, and what's the chance of being alive one year after lung transplantation? So those are things that are available publicly for anyone who is looking for a transplant. So over the last two decades, medical as well as surgical advances have allowed increased medical treatments and lung transplant survivals for patients with scleroderma. The new allocation score for lung transplantation allows patients to get transplanted earlier according to severity of their disease. Currently, um, patients with lung fibrosis, uh, we get them transplanted uh, within three months uh, of being active in the waiting list, most of them. The new uh, allocation uh, of organs by nautical miles may increase the rate of transplants for the very sick because now we have more organs being offered for these sick, sicker patients. And that's uh, it's all I wanted to talk about. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions at this point. Thank, thank you, Dr. Torres. We will have two people come on. Misty Chapman, who is the Vice President of the Board of Directors for the Texas Blue Bonnet Chapter, is going to be asking some questions. And we should also see, oh, hi, sorry about that. We should also see Jason Delancey, who is on the Texas Blue Bonnet Chapter Board of Directors and is our treasurer. So um, they're going to ask you questions that have come in from the attendees while you were doing your presentation. So I'm going to close my camera and step off. Thank you so much again. Oh, I'm Diane Lee. I'm the president of the chapter. I don't think I introduced myself earlier, but we met at a DFW support group. So I thank you very much for spending the time to do this presentation and spend time with us today. So I'm Thank closing you, out and Misty and Jason will ask questions. Hi, Dr. Torres. Thank you for presenting um, today for our event. <clears throat> Thank you, Misty. So our first question is, what is the recommended best pharmaceutical treatment for SSC ILD, a single drug like mycophenolate or a combination treatment with mycophenolate and intinidem? or mycophenolate with toxil toxilizumab, sorry. Yeah. So today, uh, the most frequent combination is going to be mycophenolate with nintenanine. Um, that's um, from the last study that just came out. The toxilizumab is so new that it has not gotten out there. Um, I assume that physicians are going to start using that combination over time, but it's not as simple as using um, mycophenolate and nintenamib. So probably uh, it will take some time failure to that combination therapy before we move forward to using ontocilizumab. Hi, Dr. Torres. What's the point in having a lung transplant when scleroderma is a progressive disease? Um, wouldn't the disease eventually invade and impact the lungs? Uh, and that's a good question um, to the audience. Um, the scleroderma lung disease takes 20, 30. How old are you for you to develop the lung disease 30, 40 years? So, we do not tend to see scleroderma attacking the new lungs like when you had your initial disease. So it is true, that's always been a concern. Can we develop the interstitial lung disease in the new transplant organ? We tend not to see that, not only for patients with scleroderma, but also with interstitial lung disease. Another question we um, have is, do you give myfortic post-op if there's no longer ILD? 
but the patient still has SSE? Yes, um, so all of the patients after lung transplantation are going to be on immunosuppressive therapy, very similar to the immunosuppressive therapy that patients with scleroderma use, as a matter of fact, more powerful. So one of our immunosuppressive agents is called mycophenolate, CELSEP. So usually if a patient is on mycophenolate before transplant, we continue it after transplant, not for the original use, meaning the lung disease, but to prevent your immune system from attacking the new lungs. Another question, do you typically do a JPEG to bypass reflux aspiration and how long do you keep it in? And that's an excellent question. Uh, what you just picked up to have scleroderma and in, uh, gastrointestinal uh, symptoms or illness, specifically achalasia or significant esophageal involvement, they are at risk of having significant aspiration pneumonias. That by itself will destroy the new lungs. So about five years ago, uh, we decided to see if we could help patients with scleroderma and other um, diseases that affect the esophagus and see if we could do something to proceed with a lung transplantation. And one of our thoughts was putting a page that way bypassing the esophagus and the stomach and feeding directly in the distal intestines, hoping that we will not have these episodes of aspiration and suddenly protect the new lungs from developing chronic rejection. So yes, all of our patients with scleroderma will require a patch after lung transplantation because of the risk of having a recurrent aspiration pneumonia and chronic rejection. Thank you. The attendee writes, I have systemic scleroderma with pulmonary arterial hypertension. The doctor recently found a tiny nodule on my lungs. Should I be worried? And what's the worst case scenario if I don't want to remove it? So um, I'm thinking that the question is more regarding to management rather than transplant. If it's a transplant related question, absolutely we will not be able to move forward with a transplant until we know for sure what that nodule is all about. Why? Because if it's a cancer and we do a lung transplant, you would die from dissemination of that cancer. If the question is uh, on a normal management of a patient with scleroderma pulmonary hypertension and now a new pulmonary nodule, the, um, the normal recommendation is going to be to monitor this nodule you are very right to be concerned about do, making a diagnosis of that nodule. Why? Because you have pulmonary hypertension and if we were to attempt to do a biopsy, you can have significant complications. So uh, it would be difficult and dangerous to do a biopsy of that nodule. And I am mo most likely your physicians would also be concerned about doing that type of procedure. So most of us would treat as if it's an infection and monitor that nodule with CAT scans and only do a biopsy if we were cornered into it where I have no choice. I need to know because this nodule keeps on growing and I have, to, and I have not been able to find the right therapy for this nodule. But each one of those are, is going to be patient to patient decision making. And I do not want to make a blanket statement because each pair, person, each patient will have to have that type of decision made one on one. Thank you. Um, we have another question for the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, this has been pretty popular today. 
Um, would you recommend the COVID vaccine to a scleroderma lung transplant patient or scleroderma patient with lung involvement? I would recommend um, the COVID vaccine to anyone who is at high risk of dying from COVID. And the reason is because we know that short-term uh, safety and efficacy is, is real. It's safe and it's efficacious. The main, cons the main question is what's going to happen five, 10 years down the line? Are we going to have complications that we have not had enough time to study them? Well, if you have advanced lung disease and you get COVID, you are going to die. It's not ifs, ands, or buts. The mortality, we're, we're talking in the 20% range. If you have a lung transplant patient who developed COVID, up, uh, up until two months ago, it was 50% mortality. We're not talking about, I'm getting sick. I'm talking about dying. So when you have that type of outcome, nobody, the use of the vaccine, it, it just, it makes sense you need to be vaccinated. And the scleroderma population is going to fall into that category. Your risk of doing poorly with this infection is too high. Just take your chances with whatever complication you may have. And again, let's emphasize, may. We do not know that you are going to have a complication from this vaccine. That's why those recommendations exist. I think we have time for one um, last question. Um, this one uh, says CMV, I guess this is a CMV negative recipient. How long do they take valcite post-op if all CMV titers show trace or no conversion? Yes, and, and that's going to depend center, center to center. Uh, at UT Southwestern, historically, we have been giving valcite for life. So you take a pill, for life. Other centers will stop it at three months. Um, most of the data supports three to six months is the minimum that you can do, um, but it depends on the center. So if your center that did the lung transplant wants you to stay for life, stay for life. If they want to or feel that you can stop it earlier, just stop it earlier. I can tell you for life, we don't have the problems of the CMB. Uh, as much as what historically the, the literature reports. Dr. Torres, thank you so much for your time today, for this information. This is a topic that we don't get to address very much, and you've addressed it in great detail. And it's something that's kind of, for somebody that has, if they have lung involvement, then it's kind of out there on the far distant future, hopefully, but just to have the information is very helpful. So we appreciate your time today, talking about both the treatments for scleroderma, you, Diana. lung involvement, and for transplants. So appreciate appreciate you and appreciate you being on our medical advisory board also.